Hey guys, and thanks for joining us here at IED Sports today. We are previewing the 2021 San Jose Earthquakes. Joined today by Fabian from Tectonic Takes. Fabian, how are you doing today? Hey, how's it going? You know, I'm, it's, a bit, it's a real pleasure of mine. It's my first appearance, so I appreciate you guys bringing me on. Thank you. No problem, and thank you for joining us. We hear great stuff about Tectonic Takes. If Why don't you let us know where we can find your stuff and how we can subscribe? Yeah, so um, you can find me at uh, Fabian Rankel, as well as at Tectonic Takes on Twitter, and then we're also on Instagram and on YouTube as well if you want to follow some Earthquakes content and a whole bunch of graphics on Instagram. Absolutely. Now, most people here that are going to be watching this aren't going to be supporters yeah. of the San Jose Quakes, but they're you know going to learn a little bit, and, and that's why we have you here to preview the 2021 season. Now, for anyone who's an MLS supporter or an MLS fan or casual MLS viewer, what about the ownership, culture, history, stadium of the San Jose Earthquakes? What do you want them to know? Yeah, so we started in 1974. Um, we started with this blue-collar, nitty-gritty kind of – um, whole atmosphere where we're not San Francisco. Um, I know the old NASL days, the, the league got mad at us for actually starting as San Jose instead of the San Francisco Bay area, because they wanted to get that global market into the team. And they also wanted to get that revenue from the whole Bay area. So it's just, that's our whole identity. And that still plagues us till this day. Um, we still have a small market club mentality when in reality, like the Golden State Warriors as well moved over from Oakland to San Francisco and they started selling those San Francisco jerseys. So it's they became a lot more profitable in that sense. And we could use that in the MLS, but we still have this, oh, no, we're only San Jose. We're only going to market in San Jose. We're not even going to touch San Francisco. And that kind of is our Achilles heel. And we have the lack of funds because of that reason. And it's a part of our own identity as well. Talk a little bit about Earthquakes Stadium, what kind of place it is and, and you know. Yeah, so um, it used to be called formerly known Avaya Stadium, and then uh, that that company went bankrupt. So <laughs> we're in talks right now to get it actually called PayPal Park. Um, but as of right now, it's called Earthquake Stadium. It's our brand new stadium. It's open five years now. I think it was last week was our fifth year anniversary. Um, but yeah, it's a great stadium. It's a little bit on the generic side. A lot of people get mad that it has an open bar area it's the largest bar outdoor bar in north america uh, and i was gonna bring that yeah. up that, yeah. you guys you guys got that going i knew i knew yeah. i don't know much about sales estate but i knew you had the largest bar area back in the, you know north america yeah and it's it's nice i mean as a casual fan you love it i mean you you can invite your buddies that don't like soccer too much and they'll love to come to a bar and hang out and whoa maybe we catch a glimpse of the game or maybe we talk to these guys that we don't even know so it's a definitely a different feel, but of course the hardcore, you know, soccer fans are mad at that because that should be a supporter section. I mean, that should be your are standing, you know, singing, uh, taking off their shirts when when they uh, score a goal, and that's a that's San Jose culture right there. Every time the ultras go ahead and and or every time we score, the ultras take off their shirts and swing them around. So it's it's a nice atmosphere, but. On the stadium side, it's a little bit on the generic side. It could use a couple of entrances and exits. Uh, it could use more attendance. Uh, it's only 18,000, which is pretty low, um, considering that the bar takes up a lot of people, and it looks like an empty stadium because the, everyone's always at the bar. So it, it's really it's a good thing and a bad thing at the same time. Absolutely. And my last question before we move on and talk a little bit about the 2020 season you guys are called the Earthquakes, which is kind of like the Chicago Fire, where you're mm. naming your team after the worst tragedy that's ever happened there. Um, yeah. How does that fit into <laughs> your club identity? Um, we we have, so the Earthquakes is a great name, in my opinion. I think it it adds a lot of uh, culture and flavor to the team. We the call ourselves too. the Quakes. Yeah, the, yeah. So we uh, we call ourselves the Quakes all the time. Uh, so earthquakes might be a mouthful, but, but personally, I, I'm so grateful. We're not CF Montreal. No, but, yeah, yeah. I'm with uh, you on that one. Yeah. I'm with you on yeah, that one. I so, hate that. That name is awful. Yeah. <laughs> but I think it adds a great part to the culture and it's a great, um, 
uh, how do I say this? It's, it's truly American. It's, it's truly an American. Class. Yeah. Hey, also honoring your NASL days. I mean, that's you know. Yeah, exactly. Nothing exactly. wrong with that. Just like just like Vancouver and Seattle are doing in Portland. You, yeah. you, you, you that's, that's I, I love it. I really do. I think it's cool. Yeah, and especially since in the past we had George Best, one of the best players in the world, and yeah, absolutely. And we we, uh, all, we all the old fans still know the team because it's the same name. But uh, yeah, we didn't know we were going to get a team when they moved to Houston, and a lot we lost a lot of fans when that happened, and. They, they finally purchased the team and put it right back and used the same name. And we are very grateful for that. But again, the spending and the, and the penny pinching, cause we're, the, our owners are the same owners of the Oakland A's. So uh, money yeah. ball, so it, it's exactly. yeah. really being money ball and Fisher, you know, it's, it's going to happen and they're going to try to cheap out on everything they can. Now let's talk about 2020 because the money ball came a little bit into, uh, into play there. Nine, eight and five, about 500 in the 2020 season, 35 goals, 51 goals against that is the league worst. Let's just look briefly at some contributors. Chris Wondolowski, seven goals and an assist. Andre Rios, five goals, one assist. Christian Espinosa, three goals, nine assists. Vaco, three goals, one assist. Carlos Fierro, two goals, three assists. Shea Salinas and Nick Lima with two goals and two assists each. If you had to sum up the 2020 season in just a couple words, what was the the, the big theme of last year? I got one word for you. Chaos. <laughs> up and down <laughs> all year long. So we lost 7-1, to 5-1, to 6-1. to one. Yeah. yeah. And then all of a sudden we beat LAFC 2-1. to one, And then we're like, wait, we can make the playoffs? <laughs> so we lost our games that we should have won. So we were going to clinch the playoffs, and we lost to Vancouver 2-1. And then all of a sudden, we beat LAFC to make the playoffs. So it's definitely – we won the games that we sh- uh, should have lost, and then we lost the games that we should have won. So chaos is – that's the word for, for me. <laughs> Absolutely. My my note here is uh, 51 goals against is obviously the league worst in a yeah. minus 16 goal differential. That stinks too. But yeah. a lot of four and five goal losses mean that even though they gave up so many goals – they were still a 500. They were still over 500 for the course of last season. So that's kind of what I think when I when I think of last season. It was I, I guess chaos is a great way to sum it up. <laughs> Alex, do you have anything to add? Yeah, I, I, some of those games. That's seven one loss. I remember. I was like, wow. I mean, it, I, we're going to ask you. Our next segment is going to be the coaching and tactics. It, the, Almeida and his man marking system. Some of right. us are confused by it. If you can give us a little background like you know is it it'll be it's a, basically it's a money ball also kind of because of money ball you guys play this way also i would guess right yeah so it, it kind of it, it kind of builds the whole idea that we're gonna use the players that we can to compete against superstars right like uh like at Atla- um atlantia in the champions league they went toe-to-toe right. with the the team i forgot on the tip of my head um the team that they actually beat in the champions league and they use that man man marking system too as well as Leeds United, they use that man marking system where you put one guy on a player and they cover them the whole game. So if you ever played basketball, it's like playing iso ball. It's completely right, right. playing iso ball. So, so if you get beat by a guy, that's one of my favorite players, Florian Youngworth, which we had on the podcast as well. But he got beat really, really bad on one play because Jordan Morris is just extremely fast. If you're two steps out of position, or let's say there's a weird deflection where the ball uh, lands at the feet of your of your man, and he just turns on the burners, you're gonna get beat, and there's no one there to protect you, and that's why you got those seven one games, those six zero games. Once it rains, it pours really in San Jose. Yeah, and yeah, it's like playing ISO ball when you call off your defenders or you call off your pick and rolls in basketball. That's basically it. You're stuck to the guy in front of you. Like, Lou, if you beat the guy in front of you, you win. But in this case, in soccer, it's, it's a lot about, you know, passing, getting that first touchdown. If you can distribute or if you can mess up those passes and really take away the creativeness of the players together and their um, and their chemistry so they can't know the one-two passes that they want to do, then you start to get a – cheaper approach to defending because you don't have to have the best defenders. You can have the uh, most hustling defenders and that really can solve that, you know, that gap in skill. High risk, high reward. We would kind of call exactly, that. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So let's talk and, a little bit about the players in and out. Cause there was a lot of movement last year. Magnus Erickson left in August. 
Vaco's gone. You lost a pair to Austin. Danny Hosen and Nick Liam are all out. I didn't make mm. a depth chart. Let's just go kind of position by position. Take a look at it. Tell me where I'm wrong. Tell us maybe what we're missing. Here's yeah. kind of the big picture for San Jose this season. Up top, you got Chris Wondolowski and Andy Rios. Now, Wondolowski lo looked amazing at times last mm. season. That amazing head goal to tie the game and send it into overtime in the playoffs. That was an awesome game. I know we were all yeah. watching there. Oh yeah. I don't think he has the legs to do it. I think 2021 was the 2020 was the perfect season. There was such a long extended absence. He wasn't playing yeah. all that often. Who's the top guy? Who's your real uh goal scorer this season? So we don't know. Um so this is the biggest question mark on our roster, really. Um Wondolowski seems like he wouldn't have the legs, but they went to preseason. He was the player that won the beat test out of all the guys, right? He's wow. still the player that has the best fitness during the offseason. And, again, this is the longest offseason we've ever had. So if he still has some gas in the tank, at least he's getting some extra rest, like you said, in the 2020 season. He's going to have it again. So he's a great option we can have up there. But we still want to have him as a super sub. I think he excels when a lot of players are tired and he just possibly sneaks away at the back post and – no one's marking him, and then the ball lands in his lap, and he scores that goal. He's that type of player where he's always in the right position. And in my double opinion, digit goals from every year since 2010, with the exception of last season, where over a full course of a season we could expect him to have re reached 10. And that's why right. he's the all time leading MLS goal scorer. I mean, you guys should put a statue outside the stadium. I, you know, it's well deserved. You know, it's no, well, I'm seriously, yeah. well deserved. I mean, he deserves it. He's right. one of the greatest MLS scores of all time. If he, if you know, I'd put him up there in front of anybody. And he, oh, for all the years, all the I've lived on the East Coast, he always gets mm. underappreciated. I think by the media and by a lot of fans of MLS. I mean, Juan Dolowski is just everyone remembers the World Cup miss. Big, you know. That's, all right, right. Know that, that ball was on a tee, Alex. You got to bury that. I know, but but yeah. up, if, if if not for that, he's. I think he's. He would be really really hard more regarded than he really is. He's he's been really underappreciated in MLS for years, in my opinion. Yeah, and. That's kind of the culture of the earthquakes, right? We defend our guys and and they I bet you they are gonna make a statue. We actually found some as a fan base on Titanic Takes, we found some fun ways to um recognize legends that aren't so big as Wandalowski, like a Shea Salinas, where he is the all-time all time assist leader in, in our club, but he's not gonna probably get a statue. So maybe we're <laughs> yeah, thinking yeah. about like like a Selena's drink at the bar or <laughs> Selena's way right. or a Selena's gate, you know? Right. So hopefully yeah. you know, Quakes FO is watching our Twitter because we do get a lot of fans that, you know, interact with us and give us some great ideas. Yeah, I remember he retweeted it, Chase Selena's, and he was like, you know what? Some power tools would just be great. You know? so, <laughs> but um, <laughs> very humble side. Uh, Wanda Lowski, again, doesn't get a lot of credit. So he's our guy, but we would love to see him up top. I don't think it's going to happen. Because I, I'm more of a hot take kind of guy. I like to, you know, think a little bit outside of the box. Uh, there's a guy named Cade Cowell. That That's what I was going to bring up. I was yeah. about that. That was my next question. You beat me to it. Yeah. Talk about yeah, Cade Cowell. Like, seriously. Yeah. Cade's been coming. Um, he, he goes at, he can really beat a player on, on the dot. He can go from zero to 60 like a Tesla. I mean, this guy is insanely fast. And he might be starting up top. Who knows? Um, he's Andy only Rios, 17, right? Am I yeah, right? He's, he's only 17 years old. He's he looks like he's 23. I mean, I remember I last year when he came on in the bubble, I, they said he was 16. I was like, you got to be kidding me. I could not right. believe that's a 16 year old. I was like, wow. And he should have been <laughs> on the Olympic team, my opinion. I mean, I saw some yeah. of the Twitter. I saw some of the Twitter videos. He's practicing hitting balls in the upper 90s in practice. I'm like, right. this kid's this kid is just this kid is amazing. And he's yeah, and he's exactly the exact opposite. Of Chris yeah. Wondolowski. Yeah, I think right. that, you know, not only play style, I mean, we're looking at someone who's 17 years old, five foot eight. They say, they say five foot eight and a half. That really means five foot seven and a half. Yeah. Um, that's with the hair, five, eight and a half. Yeah. Um, you know, kind of that, that contrasting play style. So we will see, but let's move on and talk a little bit about some other positions, in particular, the wings. You got Carlos uh, Fierro and mm -hmm. Christian Espinoza. Uh, and I guess Shea Salinas is somewhere on the depth chart for a, a winger at some point. What do you think yeah. about the wing position for the Quakes? And I think that's a lock. I mean, uh, looking at that uh, graphic that you have there, Carlos Fierro is the guy. He took over the position over Vaco last year. 
Um, we still have a you know high ceiling for him, so he's going to be there on the left wing. If not, Carlos Fierro, Cade Cowell again, probably on the depth chart a little before Chase Salinas because we'd like to have Chase Salinas be like a, a, arm, a you know, Swiss Army knife where he can be at the left back position or the left mid position or even the right back position. So um, Cade Cowell might be ahead. Uh, Chris, Christian Espinoza is a guy everybody should know in MLS. Um, yeah. He's probably going to be in the MVP race this year, especially since Jackson Ewell is not going to be at the Olympics and JT Marsikowski is not going to be at the Olympics. This San Jose Earthquakes team has what it was missing last year, and that's depth. Um, Christian Espinoza is going to be rested. He's going to have a lot of opportunities to shoot this year. So we're, we might see a 10 goals, 10 assist season from him. So he's definitely going to be in the MVP race this year. Let's look at that number 10 position because you did sign a new player this offseason. You signed yeah. Javier Lopez of Chivas, um, Javier Eduardo Lopez, i.e. La Chofis. Yeah, Chofis. Yeah, Chofis Lopez. Yeah. So first of all, we're kind of nickname guys around here. Alex loves his yeah. nicknames. And oh, I just yeah. wanted to ask if you yeah. heard the story about how yeah. he got this nickname. Of course, so, yeah. Tell, yeah, tell, he, tell uh, he looked like one of the, the guys' his girlfriends uh, <laughs> that he used to train with. So they called him La Chofis, and he had embraced it, right? So that's his name. Right. He, I mean, so I, I run the YouTube for Tectonic Takes, right? If I put Eduardo Lopez, nobody looks up that name. It's Chofis Lopez. Everybody looks up that <laughs> name. So you can't even make a YouTube video with Eduardo Lopez because people are like, who's this guy? Who's Eduardo Lopez, you know? So it's definitely. Chofis was. Pet name for Sophia, and he had a teammate yeah. whose girlfriend was named Sophia, and they called her Chofis, and apparently he looked like her. He does have a kind of a very distinct features. I don't know that he looks like any attractive woman, but uh, <laughs> it, it just makes such a great story that that that's going to be right in the back of your head the entire time. Um, yeah. He did head to MLS. He was sent out of Chivas for a lack of discipline. He was one of the mm. four players who got in trouble. There was another player who was accused. Um, of sexual assault and yeah. him and four friends were sent out of the club he was in that group now i don't want to make a mistake and say he was accused of anything he was just mm. a member that got unceremoniously uh, uh parted ways with so if anyone yeah. can bring out what they need to do you think it's matias almeida making him a true star in mls yeah and let me give a quick tidbit on that a whole story he was at that party he actually wasn't involved um, he was yes. just one of those cheapest players that was at the party. So he actually got released from the team just for being at the party. Um, but he wasn't involved with the sexual harassment at all. Um, but yeah, Matias Almeida is the guy to get the best out of Chofis Lopez because they won the CONCACAF Champions League with Chofis Lopez um, and Matias Almeida at Chivas. Um, I believe they won five trophies in two years. So definitely if there's one guy that can get Chofis Lopez – into the best shape of his life and into the best, you know, playing style, it's Matias Almeida. And we've been trying to get him here for three years. I remember I was on the, I was on the call with Chopis Lopez and he said that, that Jesse, uh, which is the Quakes general manager and Matias Almeida have been trying to get him here for the last three years. Well, so good luck. Maybe this is the year. It's, it's, it's all around. There you go. In, in 2021. Now you guys have a wealth yeah. of goods in midfield because not only do you have Chofis Lopez, you yeah. have Jack Uiel, you got Judson, and now from Atlanta, you got Remedi. So how do you yeah. think these guys are going to line up? Which pair of those two, three, would you expect to see the most often? Yeah, so I actually made the crazy comment on our Twitter um, that we have the best midfield on paper in MLS. So um, I still stand by that. I think that we have the biggest potential to be one of the dark horses in the whole MLS to win the title. Um, I feel like because Jackson Ewell's not going to be missing for the Olympics now, that we actually have a really good midfield. I think we're going to see Chofis Lopez at the 10, and we're going to see Jackson Ewell right behind him. And then Yudsin as that kind of like the defensive sweeper. And sometimes he, he goes down into that um, center back role to kind of make sure that the passes run between Alanis and Youngberth. Um, but Rometty should still see a lot of um, a lot of minutes because of the shortened season, right? So we have three days between games, and that man marking system really is tiring. So you you are gonna need depth, and that's something we didn't have last year. We had guys like Louis Philippe. Uh, playing for us, and he's starting for Sacramento now. So it's just, Remedi is just a great off-season acquisition. 
for such a cheap rate. I mean, they were bargain binning this guy because they were getting a superstar in, right? So, um, and Rometty played for Almeida already in Banfield in Argentina. So this that's is a the theme. Player. That's a theme. Matias Almeida yeah. is just surrounding himself with, with, with players he knows. That's always kind of been been a thing right and and honestly matias almeida is the best thing that's ever happened to the earthquakes because one we play oh, i think he's a great coach yeah i love him yeah, yeah. i love yeah he, he looks like he's very intense and yeah i see i remember the bubble how he was going crazy when you guys uh what a couple games i was like that right. look at this guy how would, the players definitely want to play for this guy i mean why wouldn't they? Yeah. and having a play style is something that the quakes lacked right having no sort of culture in your playing ability um, Matias Almeida went ahead and gave us that as well as these players would probably never be in Quake's gear if it wasn't for Matias Almeida. So we are actually really grateful that, Hey, if they're former players, that's okay. That's, that's totally fine. Cause he's played for great clubs. I mean, he's coached for great clubs. So if they know Matias Almeida in some way, they already know the way he talks. I mean, he talks very philosophically. So if you're an English speaker and you don't understand him, it's going to be very hard to play for this type of guy. So they always have to be a Spanish speaker when they come in. Um, they always have to be, they know him. So they already know the system and that's great because they hit the ground running and, and that's perfect for us, especially in the shortened season. Um, MLS, it's hard to adapt to this league. If you're coming in from Europe or from South America, Absolutely, it takes yeah. you about a year to get adapted. But if you already know the coach and what he expects from you, it just makes the transition a little bit easier in which uh, us Quake fans love that because that means we're just going to hit the ground running and it doesn't have to be a, Oh, we'll wait till the summer transfer winning to get a superstar player because these guys already know him and they already meshed. So, but I, I do think we're going to ride the bench for a little bit um, until you know we get the the whole swing in games and he'll get he'll it'll be a rotation. It won't be like someone's a bench player. I I agree. Even with those guys, you you can't sit on the bench for too long. Um, yeah. I love what you said about a lot of more midweek games this season than any other time right. in basically MLS history. So we'll see how that plays out. Now let's talk about this back line because we've been very optimistic so far. Now yeah. it's time to kind of you know touch on some issues. And I think this back line looks good on paper. They don't look like a fifty-one goal in twenty twenty back line. You got Marcos Lopez out left, Tommy Thompson on the right, and also a new player. Abba Cassis, is that right? Mm -hmm. Look correct. at me. We we have a <laughs> we have a, a kind of a running joke on this show that I pronounce names terribly because I have not been exposed to language in my life. So I'm like I pronounce <laughs> everything like you would expect a Brooklyn Italian to. Um, in the center, you have Osvaldo Alanis and yep. Florian Youngworth. Yep, correct. You got them right. <laughs> yeah. So those two guys, um, as the Quakes community might be expecting a center back to come in before the season. Um, and I think the general manager was alluding to that, but I, as a fan would be extremely happy if it's just flooring young birth and Alanis um, when they were playing together last year, they were very solid um, half of the year on those seven, one losses or those five, zero, it was always one of them with a very young guy, like an 18 year old or a 22 year old. So it wasn't that the starting lineup always going out there um, on the, Backs on the left back and the right back. Uh, Mar Marcos Lopez is, is those up and comer players that are just solid on their left back position. His first year that he came in, man, he was looking like a waste of money. But this year or last year, he had a great season. Um, he got some Peru national team caps. So this is a player that might use us as a springboard in the next coming years. On the right back position, uh, Tommy Thompson scared me at times. Um, he's a fan favorite. People love him because he can really go anywhere on the field and play if he comes in as a sub. So if we need a, you know, a 10 sub, that's Tommy Thompson. If we need a right back sub, that's Tommy Thompson. If we need a right mid sub, that's Tommy Thompson. But I remember I think, you, got, you guys used to play him as a forward when he first came up. Yeah. If I re remember correctly. Yeah, yeah, I remember. Yeah, he, yeah. he could play a lot of positions. Yeah. Yeah. So this guy might not be the starter. It might be Luciano Abacasis, another player that played for Matias Almeida before. Um, but he would, uh, Tommy Thompson would get beat against really fast wingers, like, uh, uh, Christian Pavon, where he would just put Tommy on heels the whole game. So that I would think would be, he's coming off the bench as well as Shea Salinas is another back position or, uh, another left back or right back, uh, super sub that can come in and play a lot of minutes too. Uh, Matias loves Shea Salinas. As 
does everyone else i he he's yeah. one of those guys that i just kind of have an asterisk for when i'm setting you know like a fantasy mls lineup like right. who is a high upside guy who might put a ball in the net today who i can right. get for 4.2 million dollar yeah, there, exactly, there exactly. they go pencil them right in um i like what you said about uh, tommy thompson being a fan favorite and not necessarily a, a good thing for the team because right. one of the players that i remember and, and this is i guess for alex um one of my first games after graduating college when I got um, I was but I got season tickets for the next season, but I was buying individual for for that year. It was back in 2012. My very first game, Brandon Barclay scored a brace for Red Bull. Oh. And I'm like, this guy must be great. This oh, guy man. must be the next big. He was not the next big thing, but yeah, it, re it retired in two years at like 25. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Kiss of death sometimes. OK, yeah. goalie JT Marcinkowski. Yeah, and that's and that's the biggest difference from last year. Last year we had Daniel Vega, and he he looked like the guy was on skates all year. Um, since they're not going to the Olympics this year, even better. We get JT the whole year, and once JT Marcinkowski became the goalie, that's when they started their string of of wins, and that's when they yeah. they stopped giving away six goals. Um, the guys wanted to play for JT. It seemed like JT was just a natural leader um, when. Last year, when the whole uh, when the Black Lives Matter movement was happening, uh, JT was actually one of the vocal leaders in the locker room before he was a starter, saying, "Hey guys, we're not going to play today." And him and Wondolowski actually went up to Matias Almeida and they told him, "We're not gonna, as a team collectively, we're not going to play today." And that shows on the field. I mean, this guy was a natural leader in the locker room before he was a starter, and the guys want to play for him. The guys want to defend for him, and that's what you want out of your goalie, right? You want a strong personality, someone that will yell at your guys, you know, if they're in the wrong position, someone that will, you know, pump up your guys that they need it, and that's what JT brings to the field. Absolutely. I love it. Is there anything we missed? Any players, anything that we, we should have touched on that we haven't gotten to? <laughs> Um, Kid Cal, I mean, again, this this is the guy. This is the guy that was linked to Barcelona last year. Kid Cal might not be here for too long. And if he scores a lot of goals this year, we might see a Daryl DK situation where a, a lower, you know, Prem club gives us an offer that we can't refuse. And and we might see him in, you know, English Premier League. This is a guy that we need to pay attention for the U.S. men's national team as well. Jackson Yule as well. Jackson Yule, I know, had a heartbreaker this last week. And he scored a great goal for them, but that wasn't enough. I mean, he had a great passes, and the guys just couldn't put it in the back of the net. But this guy might not be with us in the next couple of years as well. <laughs> Captain of the uh, men's under-23 team for yeah. the last couple of games and definitely Im impressed me. He's not – it's like he, he just carries the ball. Like he just taxis it around the field. Right. He's not – nothing tricky, nothing. He just he – just Brings the ball into empty space and he can really, really distribute it. And what a banger he scored uh, this yeah. past week. And he, yeah. he's always calm on the ball. And that's what's great to see. This is a guy that came out of the Super Draft. So all those fans out there that say, oh, there's no talent in the Super Draft. Uh, no, that's not true. There is talent that's in the Super Draft. And you have to make sure you draft the right guys. I, I know Inter Miami is, uh, is hitting their head because they let Daryl DK slip twice. So <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so I was at twice. So, yeah. yeah, so definitely this guy has a lot of talent. Uh, um, and he's still really, um, so you might see Cade Cal and Jackson, you'll leave maybe JC, JC Marcikowski leave in the future. If you're a U.S. men's national team fan, keep your eyes on those guys. Definitely one of the great young, talented U S based teams. Going yeah. back to 96. I remember LA galaxy. You guys can't stand them. Is that your number one rival? And tell us why you guys hate LA galaxy. Yeah, of course. I mean, it's just in our culture, LA Galaxy is our biggest rival, right? Um, but the MLS is really trying to push that LAFC, LA Galaxy rivalry. And right now, as of right now, our rival is Vancouver. It's like we're, we call it the third wheel derby. I mean, we, oh, we don't hate each other, so, but we always get put together on rivalry week. And it's like, okay, I mean, easy win for us. We always beat Vancouver. But I mean, <laughs> it's, it's we don't like the Galaxy because of what they stand for, right? And that's the money, the glitz, the glamour. Um, the, the bringing in players that are eight million dollars, and we're the blue collar side, right? We're the we're your you know rough them up type of a team, and and it happens in all sports. I mean, San Francisco, L.A. in baseball. Oh man, those are, that's a yeah, big rivalry. Right, right. I mean, it, it it just translate that NorCal always 
doesn't like SoCal when it comes to sports and, and as well as the sharks and the ducks. Right. So it's just, um, it's just a crazy atmosphere when, when everyone's yelling, beat LA, beat LA. And then we, we actually open up Stanford stadium when we play uh, Los Angeles and we sell out 70, 60,000 fans. So when, when LA comes into town, we love to, you know, clamor beat LA in a big stadium and sell out. So it's, it's I'll never cool. forget David Beckham's first game against New York Red Bulls where uh, they dumped him with a I was garbage bag row. full of Monopoly money. I, I was there. <laughs> I threw money at him too. I was right there. We were at the party city. Got a whole bunch of fake dis- singles we were throwing at him as he came out to the field. I was right there in the front <laughs> row. <laughs> yeah, so that that's basically San Jose Earthquakes in a nutshell. I mean, I hope you guys enjoyed this video. If you want to give us a follow, uh, we are, again, at Tatonic Takes on Twitter and Instagram. Um, that's kind of like, you know, tectonic plates since we're the earthquake. So if, uh, if you know how to spell tectonic and then you just put takes to it. Um, and then if you can, if you want to follow me, I'm at, uh, Fabian Rankle at, uh, on Twitter. So I also have a whole bunch of things that I'd like to talk about, about living in Japan and being a Quakes fan out here. <laughs> now, if you're a Quakes fan who's new to I80 sports, remember i80sports.com, youtube.com backslash I80 sports. You can find us on every major audio platform. Just a couple of them are pictured down below there. You can find us anywhere you listen to podcasts. Thank you again, Flavian, and thank you guys for joining us here at ID Sports.